Well, welcome everyone to our discussion about climate, climate risk and best practices for achieving resiliency. Thank you to the American African American Mayors Association for hosting us today. My name is Genevieve Pichet. I lead Wells Fargo's Environmental, Social and Governance Solutions Group and I'm based in the Verdant City of Charlotte, North Carolina. I am joined today by three wonderful panelists. So let's introduce them now. First, we have Houston, Texas Mayor Sylvester Turner. Elected in December of 2015 and re-elected in December 2019, Sylvester Turner is serving his second four-year term as Houston's 62nd mayor. He is board chair of Resilient Cities Network and chair of Climate Mayors, and as of today, is the new president of the African American Mayors Association. Congratulations, Mayor Turner, Thank and welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Uh, we also have uh, Paula DePerna. Uh, Paula is a special advisor to CDP North America, which was formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. Paula is a pioneer of strategic global environmental and philanthropic policy and a widely published author. She led the development of carbon markets when she served as the president of the Chicago Climate Exchange, the world's first cap and trade system for greenhouse gases. Welcome, Paula. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for inviting me. And hello, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Paula. Good to be with you. <laughs> and finally, we have Brenda Mallory, Chair of the Council on Environmental Policy, or the CEQ, for the Executive Office of the President and the White House. Chair Mallory is the 12th Chair of the CEQ and the first African American woman to serve in this role. As Chair, she is the primary advisor to the president on environmental and natural resource policies and is particularly focused on environmental justice and climate change issues. Previously, she served as the general counsel at CEQ and in a number of senior roles at the Environmental Protection Agency for over 20 years. She's helped shape many of President Obama's signature environmental Thank you. and natural resources. Thank you for that introduction. Policies. It's a pleasure to be here today. Great. Thank you very much. All right, so let's dive in. We'll start with a bit of a personal question and I'll turn this one to you, Mayor Turner. You're okay. deeply committed to supporting communities and advancing quality of life. At what point did, did it become apparent to you the extent to which climate change was going to impact your professional life? Well, uh, even before I became mayor, for example, I'm a native Houstonian. I saw the storms coming with greater frequency. Uh, it was Rita, I think in 2005, Hurricane Ike in 2008 the Memorial Day flood in 2015, the Tax Day flood in April of 2016, Harvey in 2017, Tropical Storm in Maryland in 2019, the winter storm in February of this year. So the storms have been coming with greater frequency and greater intensity. And uh, it dawned on me something is wrong, something is happening out there, the planet is getting warmer. Uh, we are just, um, the greenhouse gas emissions are increasing, they're not reducing. And it's having a direct impact not only on the environment, but on the on the constituents that I served as a member of the Texas legislature and now as mayor. Wonderful, thank you. And how about you, Paula? When when did you realize that climate change is going to impact your professional life? Well, that's a blast from the past. You know, my first uh, my writing career started completely blind to all of this. And I threw my hat in the ring to work for Jacques Cousteau, who you may remember was the inventor of uh, the Aqualung and basically a pioneer of oceans exploration. And um, it was working with him, I mean, uh, to, to realize the interaction of all this. And I mean, I've even been to Nauru, which is an island on the equator, 3000 miles from any landmass. And in 1999, we could see the ble bleaching of the coral there. You could see it was completely coated with the kind of mucousy fungus. And um, so, you know, it, it, it's been part of my professional life really from the beginning, but it began, it, it was an accident at first. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How about you, Chair Mallory? Yeah, I guess I would say I um, started working in the federal government in about 2000 uh, and um, and I was at the Environmental Protection Agency. 
And so the presence of climate change as an issue, even if an issue that wasn't getting attention or that there were arguments about whether or not it should get attention was there, I would say, even from, from those early years. But as time went on, um, more and more focus obviously has increased on climate change because of the impacts that it is having in our day-to-day -day lives. And, and my, um, my role and my engagement around those issues sort of increased with, with that uh, development as well. So uh, I, I would say it's from the federal government experience, it's been there from the beginning, but uh, different levels of, uh, of importance. Excellent. Well, thank you. So we'll jump into the crux of our conversation here. So in the last month or so, there have been important announcements led by the Biden administration, in, uh, including the American Jobs Plan and the goal to reduce U.S. emissions by 50 percent by 2030. Chair Mallory, if we can start with you, can you give us your perspective on how the American Jobs Plan will intersect with cities? particularly with regards to addressing the impact of climate change? Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you so much for, for that question, just to give us a chance to jump into the American Jobs Plan, which is, uh, I think, uh, historic in its, uh, in its breadth. Um, but first of all, uh, let me just thank the uh, African American Mayors Association for inviting me to participate and to, thank, to congratulate Mayor Turner for his uh, new role as the president, um, obviously a, an expression of the value that this organization holds in the work that he's been doing for years. Um, and I also wanna um, thank everyone who's here today, uh, participating and focusing on this panel. Um, the work that, that you all are leading at the state level and local level is vital to our ability to create resilient cities. Uh, and address climate, uh, address, address climate change. Um, your understanding and experience dealing with the compounding challenges um, uh, presented by each extreme weather event makes you an invaluable partner uh, for the federal government as we strive to expand our role in addressing the needs of communities. So I look forward to working with you on this journey, those on the panel and beyond. Um, turning to your question, I think one thing I'll just start with thinking about the audience that we have here. Um, there's no question that in the last five, that if I ask someone in the audience in the last five years, like how much have extreme weather events uh, affected or uh, impacted the community that, that, you, um, that you serve, that everyone in the room could raise their hand for um, different ways in which a particular storms have uh, impacted uh, their lives, storms and other things as well. And we just heard Mayor Turner run down the list of storms that he has kind of uh, off uh, off the top of his head uh, can just sort of recite <laughs> uh, in, that have impacted him. Um, but you know, the recent occurrence of the horrific winter storm um, that Mayor Turner and all of those in Texas experienced earlier this year is a fresh example. Around the same time, communities in Alexandria, Lake Charles, and Shreveport, Louisiana were enduring their own crisis caused by freezing temperatures, bursting pipes, and the inaccessibility of clean water. Um, but it's not just freezing temperatures. We can point to the devastating wildfire season out west last year or the unprecedented flooding in the Midwest in 2019. So, you know, climate change and the extreme weather events it fuels is impacting all of us. And, and we need bold action. That's what the American Jobs Plan uh, is. The American Jobs Plan is a $2 trillion infrastructure plan that will create good jobs, help us tackle climate change, and bolster infrastructure investment, especially at the local level. We know as a nation that many of the climate-related impacts that we need to address are occurring at the local level. It's your cities and towns that are experiencing the repeated extreme weather events and suffering from the effects of the change uh, from the changing climate. The American Jobs Plan calls for uh, $50 billion in dedicated investments to improve infrastructure resiliency against climate change through things like targeted investments to support infrastructure in overburdened and underserved communities. Um, and uh, including programs like uh, FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program or HUD's Community Development Block Grant Program. It also includes investing in and restoring nature-based infrastructure, which includes our forest and coastal and ocean resources as well. 
This will help prevent flooding in our cities and reduce wildfires devastating our local communities. Uh, and then I'll also mention the development of the Civilian Climate Corps. This is a $10 billion investment that will put a diverse generation of Americans to work conserving our public lands and waters starting at the local level. Um, finally, the American Jobs Plan seeks to empower local leaders to reshape restoration and resilience projects so that we are learning from the work that you're all doing. So there are a number of ways in which we're envisioning that the American Jobs Plan can work uh, if that funding uh, comes through. So I'll stop there. Great. And um, Mayor Turner, how um, how do you feel the federal administration priorities, many of which are um, articulated in the American Jobs Plan, how did they intersect with the priorities in Houston? Well. And, and number one, let me just say, I'm excited about the American Jobs Plan, okay? I'm excited. I do, and, and before I go any further, and, I'm, and I apologize, let me thank Wells Fargo uh, for hosting. You know, I really appreciate that on behalf of Obama. So let me just, let me, number one, let me thank Wells Fargo. So yeah, thank you so very much. And then of course to, uh, to Brenda and to Paula for being a part. Uh, let me, I'm, I'm honored to be a part. But let me just say, um, um, Let's, let's say a year ago, um, you know, we didn't have a trusted partner, you know, in the White House. And so uh, in February of last year, the city of Houston passed this resilient Houston uh, strategies. On Earth Day last year, we passed our climate action plan. But in the absence of a federal mandate or partner, or even in Texas on a state level, we had to pretty much go it alone. And so we had to work with our stakeholders and our partners here locally. We are the energy capital of the world, and we have had to work with the energy sector in order to really give meaning to our climate action plan. So we are the energy capital of the world, but we're seeking to lead an energy transition. And then at the same time, uh, there are a number of initiatives that are called for uh, within our climate action plan, dealing with electrifying our, our uh, public as well as our private fleet, uh, uh, creating 50 2.0 clean energy companies, uh, planting 4.6 million trees by 2030. There are a number of things that that um, that we have identified that we can do to adhere to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and so, but when the absence of a federal partner on this support, it would have been very difficult for us to even revitalize and transform communities that have been underserved and under-resourced that are constantly impacted by these uh, extreme weather conditions. What the American Jobs Plan does for the city of Houston, for example, is that it helps us to accelerate what we have on our, on our, um, on our books, but not necessarily didn't have all the support that we needed in order to move it forward. So when you start talking about um, a focus on renewables, building infrastructure. Those plans, the American Jobs Plan, um, align very well with, with, with our resilient Houston strategy and our climate action plan, uh, plan. When you start talking about helping marginalized communities, that equity piece, that's huge. And I want to thank the Biden administration for really focusing on that and making that a prime priority where 40% of many of its resources are going to these targeted communities, as Brenda indicated. That is a huge piece, because when you start talking about the air you breathe, the land, the water, for many uh, communities of color, they've been impacted by these elements uh, for, uh, for decades. Just like in the city of Houston, there's a 240 acre uh, landfill that opened up in the 1930s, closed in 1970, been dormant for 50 years contaminated space, holding down that low-income community for 50 years. Mm -hmm. We are now reimagining that and looking at turning that into the largest urban solar farm in the country, generating enough power to power 5,000 homes, offsetting greenhouse gas emissions by 120 million pounds annually, a $70 million investment in that community, revitalizing, transforming, and uplifting. And because of the American Jobs Plan and what the, uh, what the Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration is doing, we can help to make that even a reality. So I can go on and on, but let me tell you, on behalf of not just the city of Houston, 
but every mayor that's a part of ARMA, every mayor that's even a part of U.S. Commerce of Mayors, I had the U.S. Climate Mayors. We are excited about having the American Jobs Plan that aligns perfectly with the local initiatives that we are planning, and now we can accelerate and get it done. So thank you, Brenda, and thank you for your entire team. Look forward to working with you. Gosh, you know, you are you are inspiring to listen to, and uh, your leadership has been evident, and it is is just wonderful to see how the support from the American Jobs Plan will just put more wind in your sails. So um, thank you for that. It's it's awesome to hear. Um, and you know, I think that um, the 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 goals and the vision that we have set for our communities and for uh, reducing emissions does pose an interesting question for you, Paula. That I'd like love to direct to you, which is, you know it seems to present a new urgency around the tracking of environmental and social data, doesn't it? You know, what should cities be thinking about in this respect and, and how do they tackle the qu quantitative aspects to help drive decision-making? Oh, you're on mute, Paula. Oh, you're still muted. Um, oh, there we go. You're good. Okay. I, am I good now? Yes. You're good. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, in these days of COVID, I guess we have to have a little uh, courtesy cushion there. Thanks to the lab. Um, anyway, I just was starting to, um, to uh, add my thanks first to the Amer African American Mayors Association uh, for having me and for your leadership, uh, Mayor uh, Turner, I'm a frustrated mayor and I, you are inspiring and uh, the cities are where the rubber meets the road and, and that's where you got to talk to people and they have to like you and that's how you get stuff done. So thank right. you. Thank and you. Uh, also uh, 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 Ch uh, Chair Mallory for your um, uh, leadership and strong career and all these issues, uh, legal uh, aspects of EPA and Genevieve personally to you for supporting uh, Matchmaker, uh, particularly CDP matchmaker, which I will put on the plate for Ms. Mallory and Mayor Turner as a focal tool that we can talk about later to help you uh, spend that American jobs plan um, uh, intention. Uh, I think we can be very helpful there. Uh, but to the question, um, you know, I think what brings, first of all, the data together, it is a quantitative approach and every city probably has an inventory. We have 700 cities globally disclosing to uh, the, sh the um, Carbon Disclosure Cities Program, about 165, 170 in the US alone. And they all have inventories and they're all counting data and they pretty much know what their quote, carbon budget is. Uh, but what we find now is, I think what brings the, the environment and social data together, first of all, is racial equity and environmental justice, but also as a subset for all of us, um, the unpredictability of climate change. Prior to COVID-19, there was a very impressive and frightening study that most many American households did not have $500 cash in the bank to meet an unexpected expense. Now, when you add COVID and then you add climate change, which is a slow burn, it's all about families having an unpredictability that rises all the time. And I just heard a, 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 an interview with a, with a grapefruit farmer in Texas, actually, Mayor Turner, who, who hmm. said that his insurance policy after this big storm, his deductible was such that he couldn't even trigger the policy. He didn't even get the benefit of his insurance. That's how high the risk was. So the bringing together of environmental and social data has to remedy that unpredictability. And I think that's the number one priority for cities. It's not so much a thousand tons here and a thousand tons there, but how can we insulate our people from the unpredictability of the climate change problem? What do the data lead us to? And then of course, when we get back to infrastructure, which I know we'll talk about further, you know, these, these horrible examples of highways cutting through neighborhoods and toxic landfills being the backyard of children growing up. I mean, all of that really is also a top priority to get rid of all of that, clean it up. And the exciting thing about the American Jobs Plan, I would say, is the second word, jobs. You know, jobs creation is, is, uh, is central to dealing with climate change. It's the biggest jobs creation opportunity we've ever had in this generation or the one before and probably the one next. 
And it's about livability. So the focus on jobs, the focus on infrastructure and bringing in the social dimension to environmental issues is absolutely a breakthrough that we've needed for, for a long time, since I was diving in Nauru. <laughs> <laughs> True. Well, that's uh, that's great, and um, the jobs piece is one that we can uh, continue to discuss because I agree it's a very important theme in all of this. But you know, to um, connect back to sort of the the infrastructure piece, with, which Paula you, you mentioned, you know, this is a pretty ambitious plan, and and achieving the emissions reductions goals are going to reduce. Are, they're going to require capital from all kinds of different places. Places, and you know, obviously at Wells Fargo, we're really focused on finding ways to provide unique financing to make the transition happen. And it seems like cities may increasingly need partnerships with the private sector. Um, and Mayor Turner in Texas, you know, public-private partnerships are critical. They are today. So, can you give us your thoughts about? Um, and perhaps an example of effective public-private collaboration, and what have been the outcomes? Well, let me just say, uh, with the issues that we are facing today, either we go big or we go home. That's what we say in Houston. You either go big or you go home. This is not the time to be incrementalist, and the little you do, nobody can see it. This is the time to be transformational. So uh, either you want to save people and be holistic, or you want to maintain the status quo and we all lose because the storms don't stop because we choose to go small. Okay, they just keep coming. Uh, in terms of uh, how do we get it done? Uh, you can't do it with, without the public-private partnerships. Our Resilient Houston strategy that we put in place in February, uh, I will tell you that was underwritten by Shell. The climate action plan that we put forth on Earth today, believe it or not, that was underwritten by Centerpoint, one of our utilities. Uh, the Evolve Houston electrifying our fleet by 30%, uh, both public and private, by 2030. Uh, that's a part of what we call my Evolve Houston initiative that we started two years ago uh, with Shell and our and our G Centerpoint and University of Houston, uh, with all of them focusing on electrifying our fleet. Uh, and that requires for the private sector. With regards to getting almost 80, 86 million cars off the road, that's our high-speed train, the Texas Central Railroads. That's a private initiative in large part. That will remove, save us from purchasing 1.2 billion gallons of gasoline, removing 15,000 cars off our interstate uh, daily, 86 million mm -hmm. across the board. So that's huge. Those are public-private initiatives. And when you combine that with the American Jobs Plan, which takes a holistic approach, look, we're on the verge of, of, of really engaging in true transformation, something that this country hasn't seen in decades, decades, but something mm -hmm. that's desperately needed right now. So the public-private, look, and everybody has to have some skin in this game, okay, everybody. And that's why in Houston, let me just say, the energy capital of the world, I'm very proud of it. We don't run away from our energy sector, but we are encouraging them to move forward. And so we want to lead now in energy transition. Okay. So uh, the public, the private sector, working with the American Jobs Plan, uh, I think we are moving now uh, in the right direction. And I don't want to include uh, Wells Fargo has been a big help with this. But when it comes to housing and affordability of housing and building these houses in the right places, all of that's a critical piece. Because you don't you don't eliminate the food security without having the rooftops. So everybody that's right. has a role to play. Exactly. We'll cover off on the affordable housing point uh, a little bit later on because I think that's a really important one. But this might be also a good opportunity to to reconnect to Paula, your comment about the matchmaker program, uh, which is something that Wells Fargo has supported for the last three years, you know, with really the intent of helping us understand how we can deploy more financing towards green and resiliency projects. So Paula, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that program and key opportunities and insights for, for, for everyone here. 
Yeah, and thank you again for the visionary support because you know Matchmaker really is a map of of trending, very very specific uh, existing infrastructure needs in the country, city by city, from tiny little cities to large cities. And it's a subset of our disclosure platform where we ask cities, as I said, hundreds of cities responding, various questions about their climate action plan, their inventory, what they have in mind. But Matchmaker specifically goes to the infrastructure question. What projects do you have in your city that are uh, climate related that you would like funding for? And these have ranged from tree planting to flood control, to uh, pipe uh, fitting, to leakage resistance, but they're really very specific. And I would offer them both uh, to my other panelists. It, it Matchmaker really is a map for where the uh, some of the federal effort could go right today. But the beauty uh, of the Matchmaker is the name Matchmaker. We specifically intended it to trigger public-private partnerships. So that, uh, and something we've observed, are two, two main things that I would like to just throw out there as main observations. One, that in the cities, the sustainability function is perhaps still too far away from the financial functions that the, 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 the parts of the city that are planning the budget, planning investments, planning for the long term, they're not infiltrated yet, shall we say, with climate change thinking. And to bridge that gap would be very, very important to, to realize uh, and meet the infrastructure needs because so many of them are related to climate change uh, uh, aggressions, let's call them. And then the second thing is the cost of capital. Cities, you know, this is a time when uh, municipal ratings and, 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 and uh, inv loan lenders and bond issuers are all very focused on climate change risk. And it will not be easier for cities to address uh, climate change over time. It's only going to get harder So, uh, with regard to the challenge. So now is the time to really accelerate, as the mayor said, and the matchmaker program really tries to put these two things together. Uh, the infrastructure need with the specific city, with the financial amount um, required with the potential lenders or issuers uh, who could come into it. And of course, with the president's plan, that could also be matched by uh, federal funds. But the point is that, that we have this um, database now, which is very specific and could be very, very useful in uh, to to all of uh, to certainly the American Mayors Association, the Resilient Cities, but also the federal government. And thank you again for seeing the the value of the match because um, you know it's a, it's lonely in the vanguard, but it's fun to be out there. Absolutely, it's a great program. We're super excited, and thank you for telling more about telling us more about it, Paula. Um, and maybe Chair Mallory, just to wrap up the theme of the public-private partnerships. So in the recent announced White House plans, whether it be the jobs plan or some of the climate announcements, the role of the public-private partnership plays prominently, um, it, it feels. Can you talk about how municipalities might consider these partnerships? Oh, you're also on mute. Ah, perfect, you're good. Um, thank you. I think it's clear that the, the Biden-Harris administration believes it's important to mobilize private investment to tackle many of the crises that we face today. They're, they're of a type that really, as the mayor was just saying, like, you know, we, we all have to really be in uh, and to be part of uh, developing the solutions in a way that I think is quite uh, significant. Uh, and one way to do that uh, is through the sort of public uh, private partnerships as an approach. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, financial institutions are are key players in uh, modernizing our uh, our power grid. Uh, in the American um, Jobs Plan, President uh, Biden has proposed the creation of a targeted investment tax credit that will build more resilient transmission systems and mobilize tens of billions uh, in private capital to help us do so. Uh, the plan also establishes $27 billion uh, uh, dollars in clean energy and, uh, and sustainability accelerator to deploy private capital to clean energy, clean energy efficiency, and clean transportation. Um, and these investments have a particular focus on uh, overburdened and underserved communities that have not yet benefited from clean energy investments. So, 
this will provide much needed funds to, to municipalities uh, and, and shows a kind of an example of a kind of partnership that can be very important as we think about other ways in which um, the communities can, can, be, can benefit. Great, thank you. So I'd like to pivot a little bit to a topic that is just so important. Um, and we really can't discuss climate change without addressing the topic of racial and social justice. I'd love to hear from each of you, your thoughts on how cities can address the outsized impact of rising water or fires or potable water shortages or storms on black African-American Hispanic and high poverty neighborhoods. And I, I envision this almost maybe as a conversation and I am happy to, to, to take whoever wants to go first on this broad topic. Well, I'll, I'll start and certainly then defer to, uh, uh, to Chairwoman Mallory and, and to Paula um, because it's a, it's a big, big topic. And, um, um, and Chair Mallory and I just had a recent conversation where we discussed a lot of a lot of these issues. Um, it's so big that sometimes you kind of feel as though it's difficult to get your arms around it uh, because um, these um, individuals in these communities uh, have been impacted by climate change for many, many, many years, decades. Um, when storms come, many people who are living in areas that are prone to flood, for example, in, along the Gulf Coast, in the city of Houston, uh, where there are fires, where there are tornadoes, you name it, uh, they are impacted. And then um, when a coronavirus hits, they're impacted again and pushed down a little bit further. Uh, and you're not just talking about a, a storm that comes and goes, but in this case, we've been dealing with um, coronavirus for 14 months. And then, uh, so you have the health disparities that are built into that. Uh, and then the economic impact on businesses and jobs, people losing their jobs. They've got the health disparities. They're still trying to recover, for example, from extreme weather events. And then in Houston, when you layer on top of that, the winter storm, uh, people, for example, who don't have generators at their homes uh, and the power goes out and comes the water, and then they have busted water pipe, limited resources. It just becomes one, one burden after another, and it press and it forces you down. And uh, so it's a it's a huge issue, and that's why we have to address uh, climate change, our resilience strategies, economic strategies, uh, all in in a very holistic sense. Uh, because these communities, they keep getting hit. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, when I came in as mayor almost uh, six years ago, I said to the people in the city of Houston, I didn't want to be the mayor of two cities, the cities of have and have not. Uh, I grew up in one of these underserved communities here in Houston, Acres Home. And I'm pleased to say as mayor, I still live in that same hood. Uh, and I've chosen to stay there intentionally but a lot of that has to do with my with my mother's influence who told me never to leave. Um, so I'm still in I'm still in that neighborhood. But the point is, we we have to be very intentional and directional on on our resources and on our investment. So you know we've developed in the city of Houston what I call my complete community initiative, in addition to resilient Houston strategy and our climate action plan. Uh, it's the complete community strategies where the focus is on um, um, building uh, affordable housing, in fact, mixed income housing, uh, quality neighborhood schools, uh, economic business job opportunities, sound infrastructure. Again, I go back to the American uh, Jobs Plan, uh, green parks and green space, all of those things that you say, what does a neighborhood need in order to sustain itself? Uh, and then at the same time, um, we have to record, we factored in a climate equity coordinator because we can come forth with all of these strategies, but if equity and inclusion are not at the front, uh, then we will miss the boat. We'll do some good things, but the same communities will be left out. 
So it's about including these communities and then working very closely with all of our partners in order to um, revitalize and transform these communities. And lastly, what I will say, when I came as, as mayor, I told the people in the city, I didn't want to be an incrementalist because you can be an incrementalist and do a lot of little things. And then at the end of your term, nobody sees the little you have done. And that frustrates <laughs> people. For the mm -hmm. key. But now it's important for us to be transformational. So at least when you've done, that they can see the transformation on their neighborhood, on their street, and that makes a huge difference. But it takes working together and a holistic strategy. And that's why I'm just, I'm just um, excited about um, what the Biden administration has done on the American Rescue Plan and now on the American Jobs Plan and their focus on equity. And then Paul, I think Paula may mention about making sure we don't build highways in such a way that we are destroying communities or wiping them out uh, and displacing folk because that again impacts communities of color. Mm -hmm. Chair well, Mallory. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. No, no, I defer to Chair Mallory. <clears throat> Please go ahead. Uh, th uh, thanks so much. Yes, and you know, like listening to Mayor Turner, I'm, I'm e renewed in my inspiration about what it is that uh, we ha can we can do. Um, <laughs> as he mentioned, we uh, we spoke uh, we spoke recently, and I, I left that conversation also uh, excited about uh, what can what can happen. I mean, there's just such possibility right now. Um, one of the things that President Biden, um, you know, has committed to in this, you know, is part of the, as part of the really what the work that the administration is doing more broadly, but will certainly be impacted by the American Jobs Program is this, um, this idea of committing 40% of the overall benefits of, you know, significant federal investments um, uh, on to, to benefits to underserved uh, and overburdened communities. And, you know, the focus has been on applying um, those, uh, uh, those funds towards clean energy and energy efficiency, clean transit, affordable and sustainable housing, training and workforce development, the remediation and reduction of legacy pollution, and the development of critical clean water infrastructure. Those are the things that have been prioritized. But, you know, as, as we're looking across the the federal government and um, programs that are available, they may not be limited to that. And we're calling this initiative, you know, the Justice 40 initiative. And so there's a lot of thought going on right now about both what are the right programs and how do you how do you kick off an effort like this? Uh, and and again, as as the mayor was saying, and you know, make it have an impact on people's lives in a way that they can see. Um, and it's imperative as we do this work. Um, that we're working with mayors and other state and local governments to make sure that these funds are actually being delivered in a way that works for the communities that that you know are in need, and that we we don't find ourselves um, you know getting the money and distributing it in and and thinking that we're having an impact but in fact not having an impact. So, you know, we're the you know we can't really discuss. Uh, climate change, as as you said in the the premise of the question, unless we're sort of figuring out how we address some of these uh, longstanding issues, racial and social injustice issues, because you know it very much affects whether or not we're actually going to even have the success on the climate front, um, just by virtue of the way that the, of the communities that who seem to be the most impacted by a lot of the, the severe storms and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, other events, un, unexpected uh, events that, we're, that people are facing. Um, and I just want to close out with a, a, a quote that um, Vice President Harris has, has said that I bring up because it sort of shows the way that the administration is in, in thinking about all of these issues. She said, we know that we cannot achieve health justice, economic justice, racial justice or educational justice without environmental justice. And so those they all fit together and are an important part of how we um, see what solution looks like. It's a great quote. Paula, your turn. Well, thank you. And I, of course, <clears throat> echo what, what has just been said, but the, the uh, what I would just throw in also is that 
the environmental community needs to listen to African-American leadership more than it has in the past and to recognize that leadership. I mean, there is a broad network of experts in the environmental justice community. One of my dear friends, Peggy Shepard, national figure, started the West Harlem Environmental Action Group 20 years ago in, in New York City. Um, historically black colleges, they all have schools of environment, schools of business. Um, there's a tremendous amount of, of leadership that, that, that can be brought to bear and excellence to brought to bear to this question of, of equity. And you know, it's 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 a it's a, it's a sad commentary that there's been this sort of marginalization of of uh, um, issues. But now is the time to bring those two together. And there's tremendous resources. And the only other thing I would say is that again, back to Matchmaker, we we do have a, a, a capacity building tool for cities to for ways to incorporate more voices to to get down to the community level and listen to the community organizations or hear the individuals who are convened by those community organizations and we're going to have an overlay to our matchmaker questionnaire that now drills more deeply into the social uh, questions uh, of concern so you know the time is is upon us to really um, put these two things together and and Vice President Harris said it perfectly. Justice is justice, yeah. and you can't you can't separate the type of justice. Jim, can, yeah. I, can I just add one point there? Can of I course. just add one? And because I, I want to follow on what, what Paula said, and I couldn't agree with you more. That's one of the reasons uh, why um, I chose or uh, wanted to be head of the U.S. Climate Mayors, because oftentimes we discuss it, but we need to recognize, for example, that the climate change is directly impacting communities of color, more so than anyone else. And we can discuss climate change in a sort of neutral sort of sense, that these voices, the uh, uh, people of color, need to be at the table and a part of these conversations. Um, the, the Robert Bullock that I'm proud to say that uh, uh, the Biden administration has acknowledged at Texas Southern University, who's been fighting these issues for decades and underrecognized for decades. His voice needs to be amplified at the table. Uh, and because um, there's a direct impact on these communities, environmental justice is real. Uh, and we need to make sure that um, their presence is very much at the table, part of these conversations, and helping to design the strategies that we are being that are being put in place. Otherwise, we'll do good and still miss. Yeah. Well, I think on those note, on that note, we have. I have been advised that it's time to wrap up our discussion. We could keep going. Um, I have been um, so inspired by all of your leadership, and it, it does give great um, hope that with uh, the alignment of all of these different facets of our communities and our private sector, that we can truly make a big difference here and enact the change that we're looking for. So. Um, let me conclude by thanking you for your insights and your ongoing efforts serving our communities and tackling these challenging but critical issues. It was wonderful to be here with you today, and thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you. Thank you all. Congratulations to you. Congratulations to you.